All right. Um, we are, well, we're still here, a big talk from small libraries, uh, starting it's a little after 1 o'clock p.m. Central Time. We had a lot of good uh, lightning round sessions going, and uh, so we're a little into our next hour, but that's okay. We're going to jump right on into it. Um, Natalie Bazan is on the line. Is I pronounced that right? I forget. You got it. Yeah, okay. She's um, from Michigan, and she's the director of both the Hopkins District and Door Township Libraries in Michigan. And um, she's going to talk about uh, some free, low-cost training online workshops that you can do to get your staff up to speed on certain, you know, whatever you need. So I'll just hand it right over to you, Natalie, to take it away. All right, wonderful. This is going to be kind of interactive, so if I ask a question, please do write in. And I know that I'm going to get interrupted quite a bit, and that is totally okay. That's okay. So, I'll do that as often as I need. <laughs> sounds like a plan. Um, I am going to talk really fast because I'm going to try to get us back on time, too. So no worries. I already emailed in my slides, so you have access to those. Don't try to scribble down notes or anything like that. Um, a little bit of background, I've, I've talked a couple of times, so some of you have already heard this, but Hopkins is a tiny, tiny little rural library, serves 4,600 people over about 100 square miles, and my budget's about $100,000 a year. So I don't have, and that we maintain our own building and everything else. So we uh, don't have a whole lot of money, and I don't have a whole lot of time between the two libraries to spend on continuing ed, but it is a passion of mine, and it is something that I think all of us need to pay a lot of attention to. So just a couple of things that I put together on why it's really important to continue lifelong learning. And I'm hoping that some of you will chime in. Why do you think it's important for you? For me, it, it helps me learn new things. I don't want to do the, we've always done it that way. I hate that phrase. That <laughs> just drives me nuts. It's like, that's nice, but it's not the world that it used to be. Things have changed since then. And it helps me be more flexible. Um, yeah, everybody gets stuck in a rut. Everybody likes the, we've always done it that way. But even if it's worked for you in the past, other things might work for you better. And you should at least hear about them. So if you can think of anything, any reasons why it's really important to you, maybe things that you use to justify if you're going to go, if you want to go on a training, um, write in. I'd love to hear them, and I think all of us would love to hear them. Yeah, we actually have a bunch of those coming in right now. Um, first one says, Fantastic. Keep, keeps me up to date and fresh with what is happening now. Um, another person says, we have to be knowledgeable about many things in order to serve our, serve our community as well. Mm -hmm. um, it adds value to your organization, having the, mm -hmm. you know, getting your new, new knowledge, um, bringing new things into my community. Um, I always say, if you don't do professional development, you don't get to call yourself a professional. Ooh. So true. There's one, yeah. Um, it makes me a well-rounded person. Um, keep the creative juices flowing. Yes, yeah, see what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Ooh, avoid job burnout. Yeah. A good one, yeah. I always think about it if I'm putting money into one of my employees or into myself to attend something like this, and we'll talk about that when we get to budget, but it's not just investing in me. I mean, that's great. If I leave or if one of my employees leaves, they leave with uh, better certifications, more knowledge, and that's great for them. But before they leave, it's great for me because I get to take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. It's always good to learn new things. It is. Um, in my screens, when you guys get them, there are additional notes on the bottom. Um, so that'll give you links to websites that you can use if you're interested. Cool. Okay, budgeting, it's not just about the money. Um, obviously, Hopkins has a tiny budget. I have 100000 I think I have about 2000 Now I have like $500 or something for continuing ad. Um, but I get to supplement some of that with grants and donations and things like that, but it's about time too. And I know I'm not the only one out there who is running, running, running nonstop. If you're a lone librarian, which I, how many of you are out there? I'm going to guess that there's quite a few. Um, hopefully you can find a volunteer who can work for part of the day or the day so you can attend trainings or Thank God there are a lot of webinars that are archived, so you can listen to a little bit of it, go answer that reference question, teach story time, get back to it, and not have to be tied to that computer the whole time or not have to actually invest in the time and the effort to drive somewhere or to 
fly somewhere or whatever it has, happens to be. But you have to prioritize. What things do you specifically want to achieve? I like to write out a series of goals. I don't know how many of you look at the year or look at your strategic plan, if you've got one. Even if you don't, where would you like to see your library go? Just think about that. And what can you do? What can your staff do? What can your friends group do? What can your board members do to make that happen? And prioritize. Maybe you can find some webinars that are free. Maybe you can find some local trainings that are not terribly expensive. It's about finding something that fits in with your time and that fits in with your priorities which has been really hard, quite honestly, because you look at the list of things that I'll give you shortly, and I'm going to show you an email that I just received about an hour ago, actually, that has just a ton of upcoming webinars, and they all sound fantastic, but I don't have time for that. I don't have time to take them all. I want to, and I'm sure all of you do, too, but priorities. Okay, so how many lone librarians do we have out there? Maybe a couple. Um, yeah, if you want to, you can raise your hand, use the raise hand function uh, function on your GoToWebinar interface, and you'll see a bunch of those come up. Oh, we got a few people say me. I am also in the. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a solo librarian out there. All right. Um, how many of you, even if you're solo, if you're not, how many of you have a budget line item for continuing education or training or travel? If you know, great, let us know. If you don't know, then maybe you should find out. Just for your own information, see if that money is actually being used or if that's something that you can suggest different ideas for. I always try to budget line items for education and training, um, both for my staff and for myself. I am very excited when they come up with something on their own that they want to do. A lot of times, quite honestly, I come up with a lot of things and say, hey, guess what? I need somebody to take this training. And they're all quite excited to do it because it's something new for them. It's something different for them. Gets them off the desk for a little while. Mm -hmm. But how do you pay for it? Like I said, Hopkins has a very, very small budget. Doors budget is not that much larger. Um, the community is about twice the size. My budget's $150,000. But I have a lot more employees there. Uh, there are seven of us. We're all part-time. Um, and I want to make sure that everybody gets a chance from my teenager who's working for us all the way up to the lady who just turned 72. Um, I would like to make sure that all of us get a chance to pursue what we love and what the library happens to need, but definitely what we love. Everybody has something that they're very excited about, and I want to give them a chance to connect with the larger library community and people that are also excited about those topics. And I do that a lot of times through grants and donations and fundraising and scholarships. The American Library Association is a large, scary organization. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's huge. It's fantastic. It covers everything there is. Um, it also has a lot of grants. And it has a lot of grants that Maybe maybe not as many people know about. Maybe not as many people put in for. I don't know. But they're available. And you don't know if you're going to get them unless you try. The Association of Rural and Small Libraries has fantastic grants to attend their annual conferences, which I believe this year is in Nebraska, right? Um, I think so. Maybe no, not. no, the Fargo. No. Oh, Fargo, North Fargo, Dakota. Yep, yep, I was yep, close. Yep, yep. Uh, we talked about that this morning. Yep. <laughs> yep. I am very it was, sad. I will it not was make here it. a couple of years ago, but yeah. Oh, I made it last year to um, Little Rock, and it was fantastic. <laughs> Just absolutely wonderful. If you get a chance, go. I know it's time. I know it's money. But on the other hand, you're going to connect with a lot of people who are in the same situation you are, similar situations to what you are, and you're going to be able to create lasting friendships, lasting impressions, and a network. People that you can lean on when crazy things happen, or, hey, you want to do a Dancing with the Stars episode. You know who to talk to, besides just coming on here, of course. <laughs> uh, grants, donations have been 
my number, my one and two. I do a lot of grant writing, and you know, you get some, you lose some, but you have to try. So let's touch on some webinars that I've looked at and that I like to go to. Web Junction, I know you guys mentioned this earlier, they have topics, everything from WordPress, community engagement things, programming, grants, they actually cover a huge gamut, and they're free. A lot of them are free. Um, ALCTS has sessions that are all pre-recorded, and it's really nice once they're six months old, they're free for you. And they tend to run more on the technical side, which is great if you're doing your own cataloging and you want to find out more about RDA, you're starting to do some metrics, you need to find out more about that. If you're into grant writing, grant seeking, TechSoup has some really great things that they come out with, and they're all free. Info People has been really, really nice for me when I'm doing surveys or I want to put together different ways to measure programming. It's been helpful and they're all archived. So <laughs> if I'm up on the desk and somebody's asking questions or I need to go and teach a computer basics class or what was the latest one I did, uh, barn quilts. We painted barn quilts, sorry, no pictures. Um, and you know you have to go and help people taping out their boards, you can come back and listen to the next section of the webinar before you have to run off and somebody, one of our teenagers, dripped white paint on our carpet between the table and the bathroom. That was fun. Um, but it gives you that, that opportunity. So not so free. I'm focusing mostly on webinars because travel is expensive. And like I said, the, the grants that ALA, PLA, the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, everybody has um, are fantastic to attend larger things, to attend ALA, to attend PLA, um, but there aren't that many of them. And although I would love to say that all of you should get them, and I think all of you should get them, it doesn't mean that all of you will get them. But keep applying. So in the meantime, webinars. PLA does some fantastic webinars. Some of them are free, and they always make sure to put on there which ones are. If you're a member of PLA, most of them are a lot less expensive. And for single use, if you're just going to go on there, they're only 28 bucks, So they're not terrible. If you've got a whole group of people together, maybe you've got a library system, again, they are not very expensive. Um, University of Wisconsin, I get emails and pamphlets from you guys all the time, and God, I wish I could take all of them yet again. Um, there are so many things in this profession, it's hard to keep up on everything, but everything is fascinating. If you happen to be, you happen to have a certification that requires continuing education units, or maybe you're a school librarian and you need those to keep up your certification, you can get them through the University of Wisconsin. And some of their programs are very affordable at $65 a piece. They range um, the gamut. I think most of them are right around $200. And they are very intensive. They are fantastic programs. ALA offers several certifications. If, if you can get donors to fund you, these are very, very well worth it. The CPLA, the Certified Public Library Administrator, is seven classes. I, I just got accepted into the program and I'm working on it now. And those classes run the gamut from marketing to finance to, I'm working on buildings right now, which is great because we're looking at a building edition at the same time. And those classes run about $300 each. So they're not super cheap, but they're very, very well worth it. Again, I, I, this is my second class, and I am meeting up with several people that I had in my last class, so we are forming a wonderful network, and I have talked to these people at conferences. It is very, very helpful. And Info People. Info People has lots of classes. Um, California librarians, I don't know if there's anybody in here, but I get emails all the time telling me, you California librarians get these classes really cheap and I have to pay a little bit more. But you know what? They are great classes. 
Uh, national, state, and local co-ops and associations. I We have quite a few in Michigan. We have a fantastic rural library conference coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, we are very, very lucky. The Library of Michigan does programs and collaborates with us. The Michigan Library Association does things. We have MCLS. We have a lot of different organizations here, along with our local co-ops that at least my co-op has a great continuing education to, um, group that puts on things every couple months for us. Um, but if you don't happen to have those, you can learn wonderful things from the Learning Roundtable. If you're an ALA member, join up with the Learning Roundtable. Um, if you're a PLA member, look at the webinars on demand, look at the ALA archived webinars. Listservs I want to touch on. Um, and I am going to go over to my email, so this is live, so if weird things pop up, I don't know anything about it. Um, but I just received this one from ARSL, so the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, on their listserv. And these are conferences for March. Look at this massive list. It is fantastic. They put together a wonderful comprehensive list for anything you can think of. And if I keep going, you'll see that they include descriptions for all of these things. Fundraising, I think I want to do all of those at this point, <laughs> since we're also looking at the building edition. Um, and programming and outreach are both my passions. I enjoy doing them very much. But there is no way that I can fit in 15 to 20 webinars in a month. There's just no way. So prioritizing is going to be something that I have to work on. I like how I, I, also, I do like how this list and some other ones do this, um, arrange them by topic. Yes, so that you it can is get very helpful. I'm interested in or I work at a school library, so I need to know what are the things that are um, appropriate for school librarians to potentially watch. Yeah. Which is really, really helpful, especially when you don't have the time. You know, you don't have the time to go looking for these things on your own. Being part of a listserv that puts out things like this, mm -hmm. seriously helpful. Now, how do you get on, saving. someone wants to know, how do they get, how can they get on this listserv for ARSL? Is this a public thing for members? I'm not exactly sure myself. You need to be, yeah, you need to be a member. Um, but membership is really, really cheap. I think uh, individual members, membership mm -hmm. might start at like $25, something like that. It's not very expensive at all. Yeah, they and, mentioned that this morning in their session, in yeah. their presentation, yeah. I uh, I have no desire to ever leave small libraries. I really love working at small libraries, and I have to say that it, programs like this and groups like this are wonderful ways to get together with other small librarians and get an idea on how to do assessment, how to do a strategic plan for your library. Uh, if, when you don't have one of the people in a class that I'm in said that they're looking at doing $10,000 for a plan like this. I don't have $10,000 to put towards a plan like this. I um, don't have $10,000 to put towards anything, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when I can take a class like this, and maybe it's free, maybe it's a little free, um, I can do it with the help of some community members. It is very, very helpful for me. Okay, does anybody have questions? Um, let's see, we do have some, we had some comments before when you are talking about um, funding, if people have funding. Um, yes. Most people said they did, um, some not very much. Um, a few people said no, there isn't anything specifically for, as you said, specifically for uh, professional development. Um, but a lot of mixtures of, of things, um, sometimes a separate budget, one for travel, one for training. Um, some can use their tuition reimbursement monies f towards that for the, if they're in school. Uh, and one person says, I'm using it for ARSL this year. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So, yeah. Um, someone, because you had mentioned getting grants to actually attend some of these sessions. Is, I guess, is there anywhere you can go to find more information about how to write a winning grant? How to, I think I saw on that list there was some grant. Workshop. Yes, but I, I suppose there might be a different of uh, writing a grant for like programming at the library or construction. It may be different from writing for attending a session of some sort. Right. TechSoup does a great grants program. They do wonderful topics on grant seeking and grant writing. Um, there are several others. Web Junction has some nice grant writing programs. 
Um, but if you're going to, you're applying for a grant to attend some professional development, you want to tell a really good story. You want to make sure that people understand that, one, you need the money because if you're applying for it and your library has the budget for it, then why would we give you the money? Um, mm -hmm. And two, that you're going to use this. This is going to be really necessary for your day-to-day -day life. This is going to be a huge boon for your community. It just make sure that you can write a good story. Be passionate about it. Make sure that they understand that you know they don't have that much money to give out. You know that it's really special for them to pick somebody, whether it's you or somebody else, and give them a really good reason to pick you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Why me, as opposed to someone else who is presenting, is uh, submitting the same grant request, yeah. Right. And it's hard. It's not easy whatsoever. But if you have something unique, maybe your community has a special need, maybe the conference is going to have a particular speaker or a particular session that is going to be really, really influential for your community, for your career, then make sure to bring that up. It's the little things that seem to count a lot. Mm -hmm. And people are asking about ARSL. Uh, someone mentioned, and I did look it up, the, the ranges for um, being a member of the Association for Rural and Small Libraries, anywhere from down to $15 up to $59. Um, that's individual membership, and it's based on um, your uh, type of a employee you are, whether you're a student, retiree, friends, trustees, volunteers, get the $15, and then it's based on salary. Um, more salary you make would be a little, but the highest is $59 a year. So it's fantastic for all of us because I don't know about you, but small libraries don't pay the best. So um, I don't think it's going to be terribly expensive. And like I said, they have a couple of grants to attend ARSL as well. Right. And they definitely put in for them. And someone did ask if it is available, ARSL members are available to Canadians. I do not know. I don't know. Um, if someone can tell us that, is, any, is anybody still, are you guys still on from ARSL, JED, or anyone? Uh, let us know if it is, because I'm not sure. Okay. I, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I met librarians from all over the country when I was in Little Rock, but I don't remember meeting anybody from Canada. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, Becky is a previous, one of their officers says, yes, it is available for Canadians, ARSL. So go ahead, Canadians, join them. <laughs> Wonderful. They've tried to reach out. Yeah, so definitely, if you've got anybody here who's on, go ahead and go to the ARSL website. You've got it linked off of our page, and uh, you'll be able to join up. Okay, the only other thing I wanted to touch on um, and ask everybody else about is outside of the box training. So, where do you go for any type of training that maybe it's not strictly library related? Um, I have a couple of sources here, but I was going to talk on some other things. I We're working on this building project, and yeah, it's going to take a while, um, but I don't know that much about buildings. Let's be realistic. I spend most of my time in a library. I do not spend most of my time out building things. Um, however, I stopped at our local code inspector, and uh, they said... They sat me down and said, what do you want to know? I told them, well, this is what we're looking at. Is this feasible? What should I ask contractors? What should I be looking for? What should I be asking um, their references? And they went through, oh my gosh, I think I was there half the day. Um, they went through everything they could possibly think of. It was very, very helpful, very knowledgeable people, and... I don't think that many people go in and ask them these questions. I think most of the time they're dealing with builders. So they were having some fun. Um, but that's one of the things that you need to know, that you certainly need experience with if you're going to do any kind of project, even if it's just a renovation and you need to know, hey, can I accommodate that extra bookcase here or is that going to be too narrow? Is this going to have an effect on ADA requirements? Is this going to have effect on our lighting requirements? Do we need more sprinklers or, well, heaven forbid you have sprinklers. Um, if Do we need more fire extinguishers? Should we have different types of batteries in our smoke detectors, which I found out that we should? Um, our fire department came in. And they did a wonderful assessment of our building um, and door. 
in Hopkins, it's pretty small, and <laughs> I don't really have that issue. I have about 1,200 square feet um, of usable library space, and then we have the township offices in there and all kinds of weird stuff. Uh, but indoor, it's about 7,500 square foot building. However, it was built by a pool barn builder. Um, so there are a lot of issues that hopefully none of you have to deal with, with a huge, big, open building. Uh, it has been really interesting, but the code inspectors have been very helpful with that. Our fire departments have been very helpful with that. So where do you guys go for training that maybe it's not strictly library related? Have you ever oh. gone to... Mm -hmm. Has anybody gotten creative with their education? We've gone to the health department. We're talking about the possibility of putting in an industrial kitchen. So we've had them come out and do an assessment of our area and tell us what we would need and talk to the staff about what they their needs would be and their expectations would be to keep this a commercially viable kitchen if we wanted to be able to rent it out to patrons or to do classes in it or different things like that. Okay, here's a few. Um, someone says, our local Chamber of Commerce has a speaker at their monthly luncheons. Um, and the luncheons are $10, and they the library can present, but then other speakers they would see there that are not, obviously, library, state labor commissioner, fire chief, disabled services advocate, so they attend those uh, Chamber of Commerce presentations. Um, That's wonderful. Someone has gone to the county sheriff for security training. That's something they maybe need to be aware of. Um, it went to the fire hall and learned how to use a fire extinguisher, learned defensive tactics from a police officer. Um, yes, we had a SWAT team member come in and teach us all um, self-defense and defensive tactics, and then we had him come in for an additional couple classes for our community, which were really, really well received. Mm -hmm. um, uh, our, our library is offering universal class to patrons, and our director, doc, our director also encourages staff to also do it. Someone else mentioned that as well. Um, women in business groups, the Red Cross. Um, oh, we attend storm um, spotter training for out here oh, with wow. it in Tornado Alley. Heck yeah, <laughs> definitely. Be okay, that's something I don't have to deal with. <laughs> Although now you never know where you might find a tornado nowadays. That that's true. I have the blizzards, but not so much the tornadoes, thankfully. Um, let's see, training in organization and curriculum through universities hosting on Coursera. That's I always meet a few other librarians in those classes. See, that's interesting too. If you encounter other librarians who are doing the same thing you are in some of these more um, national or international type online sessions that you can attend. See CPR and first aid training from the first from the Red Cross. That's all very good when you have a lot of um, the public coming in and using your facilities. We had a local organization, a um, a salon actually, that donated an AED to the library to both libraries actually, mm -hmm. and we had a local ambulance service came in and did CPR training and AED training and got us all certified for it. Hmm. Oh, here's when um, someone says they became certified in first aid CPR, and now I have a Red Cross trainer come in to teach a babysitting courses for the for the kids, for the youth, anyone who's going to be doing um, babysitting, so that they can then maybe promote themselves as you know, hire me to be your babysitter. <laughs> Um, Red Cross has also offered to do things like uh, just regular first aid and cleanliness and different things like that for little, little kids. Um, they did pre-K for us and they do all the way up to high schoolers for, yeah, the, the babysitting classes and things like that. But they like to do different first aid classes for us, which is really helpful mm -hmm. in our community. Mm -hmm. What about hunter safety? Does anybody team up with the DNR? I, I don't know if everybody has DNR or if it's different in different places, but the Department of Natural Resources does classes for us. And they do trainings for us on, you know, how to safely handle a gun if somebody comes in, what Open Carry Act really means. Yeah, that's something you definitely want to know if and if that is something in your 
state area that you'd want to know what is and isn't allowed. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else has issues with things like that, but occasionally we do have people who like to open carry, and it is not against the law. They can mm -hmm. open carry. We just try to make sure they do things responsible. And mm -hmm. uh, someone said Red Cross. The Red Cross is a wilderness first aid, uh, wilderness first aid class, and that'd be good for those preppers out there. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You got those in your area, absolutely. Um, community emergency response team. Um, oh, have the local banks come in to do something money-related. Has anybody done active shooter scenarios at their library? Uh, yeah. We actually just went to one here that the state of Nebraska did for us. It is frightening and horrifying and a fantastic class to take. Yep, we did have some people saying, yep, yep, we did it here. Someone did an online version of that as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ours was run by a local sheriff who did the, about a two-hour presentation for us. Or disaster scenarios, um, you can talk with your emergency manager. I have a wonderful friend that I went to high school with who's an emergency manager at a county just north of me, and I've talked to her about putting together disaster manuals for the library and doing possible disaster scenarios and how can I back things up and how can you keep the library going during a disaster if, if that's possible, which it may not be. Right. Um, and here's something that's interesting. Uh, they encourage our libraries to put um, training opportunities into their technology plans so that it specifies um, that the library is actually closed for two days a year for the entire staff to go to tech training at no cost from their regional library system and the board signs off on the technology plan and allows them to do that. So build it into the actual strategic or technology plan for your library that this is something that is important and we will support and, and have them um, get them to go and do it, yeah. A network, National Network Libraries of Medicine offers training resources for disaster planning and response for libraries. Um, so that definitely somebody to reach out to. I know they do some, um, we have the National Network Libraries of Medicine do workshops and webinars here in Nebraska. They have local offices all across the country, um, but they will come and do something specifically for you as well. I have seen some of those um, preservation webinars and preservation preservationists. Uh, we have some wonderful ones at local universities, and they have come and given talks for my co-op. They've given talks to I, I have sent various staff members there on everything from just the basics on how to repair a book fast, easy, and cheap, and how to repair something that is of historical significance or how to handle something like that versus your your typical paperback that we just want to make it last as long as we can. Mm -hmm. And they have been really very realistic and have given us really great advice. Um. Oh, a mental first, as a couple of people mentioned this, um, mental health first aid class for patrons that may be coming in with issues such as that. Yep, the, there's a mental health organization just north of us. Um, we don't, the one in our county has not done very much with libraries, but we're close enough to another county that is much larger and they have a lot of outreach. So they have come in and done talks with us and different scenarios. If you have somebody, say you're in a group of three and you're trying to understand what it's like to have a voice talking in your head the whole time, they had um, one of the group talking in the ear while you're trying to talk to another person and carry on a conversation. Uh -huh. It is hard. Uh -huh. It is really, really hard. That's nice to have. This is what they're actually experiencing, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Practical application is wonderful, but on the other hand, it is, it is difficult, and you get a new sense of what people are going through. Mm-hmm. Um, so here says that they are required by their city to take FEMA classes for disaster training and emergency management. Um, so it's a, the city requirement. If you're a city office, that may be something as well. And that comes lots of places. We've heard this with lots of disasters that have happened, both um, natural disasters or some of these like community disasters, we'll call it, um, that they are becoming safe zones, that people will come there first to use the Wi-Fi to keep up what's going on. Just And this libraries are lots of times on the first lines of, we are open, we are here, come here. If your internet is down because there was a blizzard, <laughs> a tornado yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, another thing to look at is finance training. 
Uh, the, I know that our local IRS office has different classes. There are a lot of people who, maybe they're bookkeepers, maybe they're CPAs that will do little classes or come in and do little tutorials for you. If you're just getting into a director position or a position where you have to deal with financing and budgets, they're very helpful. Even if you're just going to look at writing grants, they're very helpful to understand exactly how to put together a budget for that program mm -hmm. and how to carry through with it and what forms you need to look at and who do you need to 1099 and what is the cutoff and right. all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is a good one. Sign language classes. Take sign language classes so you can assist any of your hard of hearing patrons if they do that. Oh, that is a fantastic idea. Oh, and also it says here, someone says the National Network Libraries of Medicine can also train, does training to help libraries, um, to help your patrons apply for health insurance, the new health insurance marketplace that's out there that they will help you figure out how to help them or bring in trainers to help you get your patrons onto health insurance. Michigan has a wonderful Department of Finance and Insurance, and they will actually send people out to all the libraries and do programs on how to apply for insurance, what do you do if you have a teen driver, how do you take care of that on your, your car insurance, how should you change things, how should you prep for Social Security, how should you prep for retirement, mm -hmm. um, all sorts of different things. I just got uh, the updated list of what they'll be teaching coming out. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. And also this one, yeah, someone here just mentioned the university extension offices um, here in Nebraska. Our University of Nebraska um, extension does programs on all sorts of things. Um, so that would be somewhere good to look into and see what kind of programs they have available that you could, and what kind of trainings you have, they have available that you could uh, participate in. I'm so jealous. You guys have some neat things coming up. <laughs> Okay, guys, that's about all I had for you. I was hoping to leave lots of time for questions because last year I did not leave very much time for questions, and I was trying to keep us on time <laughs> and on topic. So That's good, yep. Yeah. Um, we do have some questions that did come up, too. Um, Great. Let's see, what do I have here? I mean, it does, if you do have any other um, questions um, for Natalie or for anyone else wanting to know how uh, – we can get info, info from other librarians on the line here. Um, if you're looking for some sort of training in some area or you have know there's some sort of issue, what, uh, where can you go for training? You know, offer your ideas. Um, someone wants to know, besides price, what is the difference between the different webinars you were mentioning earlier, the ones that are free or not? Is there, you know, how would you make A lot of them cover different that? topics. So mm -hmm. you can look at... Okay, the paid ones often, especially the University of Wisconsin and some of the PLA ones will offer you continuing education units. So if you are a school librarian, maybe you went for the Certified Public Library Administrator program, I know that you do need uh, continuing education units to keep those certifications going. Mm -hmm. And I know that some state certifications also require you to continue do doing education units. Um, Michigan is not like that. Once we once we get our certification, we have different classifications, and once you get it, you have it. Mm. Yeah, here in Nebraska, there, there's a certain number of um, continuing education credits, and it's, uh, it's a three-year rotation. Things last for three years, and then you'd have to um, start over and do some more training, okay. more professional development. So. So. So some of these might be really useful for you. Also, some of the webinars that are free do offer continuing education units. Um, I'm going to go back to not that one, this one. Meme here, the first one that I have. It's a Michigan organization. I believe anybody can take care to can take these classes. They're not specifically library. They're actually for teachers, but a lot of them, I I have a teacher on my staff and she said, you know what, I use some of these things in my classroom, but I'll use a lot of these things in the library. And for her, it was 10 bucks to get the continuing education clock hours that she needed. Not bad. Uh, they will send you, no, they'll send you the certificate after you finish up the program. And you have to, it's a six-week course. Um, you turn in a couple of things of homework, and you participate in conversations. Um, a lot of the free webinars here that I have, a lot of them are recorded. Not all of them. Some of these are live, mm -hmm. but you know, the recorded ones, you don't get that chance to interact with people. You don't get that chance to ask questions, which, you know, if you're just looking for the information, 
that's fine. Right. But if you really want to be able to talk and discuss and find out if your ideas would work or what they think about different things that you've done, it might not be the topic for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it depends on how you how you do best. How you with, learn. I mean, yeah, how you learn, exactly. Your learning style and your learning preference. Um, we have our, we do a weekly online webinar here, um, and we also record it and post the archives up. And we have noticed that statistically about twice as many people attend, watch the recordings. And I know it's just because not everybody's available at the time when these are being um, done live. I wish very much with some of these recordings, and I know, you know, some of these are six months old or older, so that's not realistic, but I wish with some of these recordings that you could go on there and ask questions still. Um, That would be very helpful, but realistically, there are a lot of webinars out there, so hopefully the topic that you want, maybe it wasn't at the time that you wanted it, and it will come back up at a time that you can attend. Mm -hmm. That's true. Lots of times they redo a topic. Absolutely. Or update a topic. That was in previous one. Um, Here's a good question. Is there a source for training specifically aimed at solo librarians? Hmm. Not that I know of specifically. Um, Doesn't mean there's not. I'm sure there probably is somewhere. But not that I've run into specifically. At Hopkins, I have two part-time staff and me. And I'm also Mm -hmm. part-time. so depending on the day, any one of us is a solo librarian. So I, I'm very familiar with the, the trials and tribulations that you can be going through, um, which is why I like the recorded webinars, mm-hmm. because it gives me a chance. Maybe I want to watch it on a day off or, um, well, if I want to do library stuff on days off. <laughs> um, maybe, you know, like I said, you can get back to it after you're done with story time or after you're done helping somebody paint their barn quilt or mm-hmm. you never really know. <laughs> a lot of, some of the things, maybe if you look into things that are done through the Association of Rural and Small Libraries, I mean, that's kind of what rural and small libraries, that lends itself totally to a solo librarianship because that's the situation. And that's how we are in Nebraska. Lots of libraries that are individual, independent, just by, run by one person with maybe a couple of volunteers. Um, we have a lot of those. Let's say that too. some of the classes they do attend and look for do assume a staff or an organization that doesn't exist, that there is a staff. So it's hard to find, yeah. Okay, a very quick note. Um, I applied for some of those ALA grants that I was talking about earlier, and I did get one to attend ALA and to attend a pre-conference. I attended a pre-conference. I'm hoping I'm not going over time this time. Um, I'll talk fast. I I attended a pre-conference on library media centers. I thought, this is great, right? I have a tiny little library, $100,000 budget, maybe I can do some of this stuff. It'd be cool. I would love to be able to offer it to my community. I get in there, and they're talking about staff, staffs that have dozens of people oh. who don't have library degrees. They have technology degrees. They're spending 7 to $8 million on putting in this one small area in their library. And I'm just sitting oh. there thinking, what am I doing here? Mm-hmm. At the end of the program, I asked them, so what gets used the most? They said our VHS to DVD converter and our photo scanner. So hmm. I go home, and for $400, I put those in. Um, yeah. And they yeah, do. They get used yeah. a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually totally, what your experience speaks totally to why this conference exists. We heard the same thing from people saying, I've gone to PLA, I've gone to ALA, and they got great stuff, but it's so not focused to me. It doesn't, I can't identify with what they're trying to tell me. ARSL conference, Totally does oh yeah um, but the availability to travel to them and that's what your whole presentation is about you don't always have the ability to travel wherever they're going to be in the country this year necessarily so um that's what we're hoping this is, is that it helps out people yeah i think it's very important to just find that one little thing even if you find one tiny little kernel out of a webinar or out of a program that you go to like that media center program i went to that you can use and you can adapt it's a huge benefit for your community. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't have any way to preserve VHSs in Hopkins, um, but now people can come in with their homemade VHSs, make them into DVDs, make a bunch of copies, give them to the whole family. Nobody's fighting over them when somebody dies anymore. 
Uh, Very yeah. helpful. Yeah, Trust me. <laughs> okay, just a couple last few things. We are about done with the time here. Um, someone does say that they think the Special Libraries Association might have a solo librarians division. So look into that, potentially, Special Libraries Association. Um, and someone wanted to know what was the organization we are talking about, the National Network of Libraries of Medicine. NNLM, so Nash, it's a it's a weird phrase, but National Network of Libraries of Medicine is the one that does a lot of um, they have local people in each state that can um, help you out with lots of different training. Um, and just as a quickie last thing, could you Natalie review your population served by your different locations and how much staff you have at each one? Like what are you working sure. with there? Let me go back to the beginning. Hopkins Library serves about 4,600 people. Um, it's in a village of about 600 people, actually, but I'm within walking distance of the elementary, middle, and high school, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's over a square mile, 100 square miles, give or take, mm -hmm. which for me is about three townships. And it has a staff of three, <laughs> um, me and two part-time ladies, and I'm part-time there. I'm also part-time in Door. Um, Door serves about 7,400 people. It's only one township, so that's 36 square miles for me. And it's, it's located right off an expressway, so I have a lot of commuter traffic, mm -hmm. but it's a mix between commuters and the old farming families that were there. Mm -hmm. So it leads to a lot of interesting things that come up. Yes, interesting and combination. <laughs> I, uh, I have a staff of about seven there, and everybody's part-time again. Mm -hmm. So you do have some people more than some of these individual ones, but everybody being part-time is a different yes. thing to have to deal with. Yeah. All it right. Is. Thank you very much, Natalie. This is great, really good resources. This is the kind of thing we're definitely trying to do here as well. Um, get your education, um, get your continuing education. Someone did say, I'm a volunteer. Would that be, would this be good for me? Of course. If you're anyone who's yes. in the library, this kind of uh, professional development and continuing education is going to benefit you in some way. Anything that can help you do your job? Yeah. <laughs> Like I said, if I'm investing time and money in something like this for one of my staff, I look at it as it's going to benefit me until they possibly leave, and then it's going to benefit them later in their career. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Natalie. Thank you. For joining us.